Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. When I was in college, I decided to take a religion class. At that point, I had already decided that I wanted to go to a seminary, and I thought, well, let me just see what this is all going to be about. And I remember the professor teaching us about a, a theologian that was very famous back in the 40s and the 50s and into the 60s named Paul Tillich. And when talking about God, he said, the way you define God is God is your ultimate concern. In other words, God is that person or that, or, or that being in which you place your ultimate devotion. God is the center. Your God is the center of your life, whatever you would define that. And the answer to that question of who is God is significant. I believe can get you killed or thrown in prison. In ancient times, if you were not willing to bow to the emperor, or in many places around the world today, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, can get you thrown in prison or even worse. And people who offer that statement leave behind their lives, their old life, and instead they live a life that involves some risk. Statements of faith are serious business. Someone described the creeds as being a summary of the 66 books of the Bible, a bird's eye view of thousands of years of a faith community sharing faith and seeking to know God at a deeper level. Creeds are statements of belief. They are baptismal statements and confessions where we as individuals or we as a community gathered together say we believe. It is to whom we offer ultimate allegiance. And it speaks both to God as well as to the people around us, whether they are fellow disciples or persecutors alike. It is a statement that this is my God. And it's not just my creed. It belongs to the community the one holy Catholic and apostolic church through the ages. It's not just my own popular opinion or how I look inside myself like as if this, this is what I think or this is what I feel. The creed declares an allegiance to the community of faith whose faith is stipulated in the text of the creed itself. And it's a way in which the believer enters into that very communal relationship of God, Father, Son, and Spirit. A creed is a statement of belief, is an act of faith, and it is a praise of God. The first article, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Martin Luther said of this, I believe that God has created me together with all that exists. God has given me and still preserves my body and soul, ears, eyes, all my limbs and senses, reason and all mental faculties. In addition, God daily and abundantly provides shoes and clothing, food and drink, house and farm, spouse and children, fields, livestock and all property, along with all of the necessities and nourishment for this body and life. God protects me against all danger and shields me and preserves me from all evil. And all this is done out of pure fatherly and divine goodness and mercy without any merit or unworthiness of mine. For all of this, I owe it to God to thank and praise and serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. First thing we notice is we are permitted to call Jesus' Father our Father. His Father is our Father. His God is our God. 
And all things are in God's hand. All events are subject to his will. They're not in our hands. He takes our hands into his. And because of our ultimate uh, reliance on him and this gifts that he provides for us, we see Luther's understanding of justification by faith. We don't come to God because we deserve anything. Instead, he freely gives it. God creates. It's in his nature. We see it in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. An explosion of sheer energy. And the creation comes into being by God merely speaking it. And in that way, God is the great communicator. The great speaker of the world into being. Never by force, but always by personal address. And God values what he creates. God is the great chooser and lover of what he creates. God chooses, and what God chooses to create is very good. It has a purpose for your life and for my life. We are created a imago dei in the image of God. And so we can participate in that divine image of God himself. And faith accepts ownership of this God and the stewardship of the creation in which God has created. You and I have a responsibility to care for what God has created and to respond in kind so that we preserve and protect what God has made. The second article of the Apostles' Creed is, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Luther said of this, I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father in eternity, is also a true human being, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He's redeemed me, a lost and condemned human being. He's purchased and freed me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. And he's done all this in order that I might belong to him, live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in eternal righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from the dead and lives and rules eternally. This is most certainly true. The second article of the Creed identifies who the Son is by basically telling the story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is the one who died and rose again. And we see these these facts that are laid before us, and they're not random at all. There are some things that are left out from the life of Jesus. Notice that there's nothing about all of the miracles that we have of Jesus. For those early apostles and, and leaders in the church who put together this creed, It was not a matter of faith whether or not you believe in the miracles of Jesus. You certainly can. But it is a matter of faith that we recognize he is the only son. He's not just some guru that has come along, some other savior. He alone is the one who claims the identity of God by virtue of his death and resurrection. And his two titles are Christ and our Lord. Just as God had taught the Israelites to wait for the promised Messiah, to look forward to that Messiah, the one who would save them, the church confesses that Jesus is that person, the promised Christ, the Messiah. And he is Lord, and we are his disciples. And he defines our life in his life. And this Jesus was born into history, not apart from it. His story doesn't take place in a Mount Olympus. It takes place right here on earth. 
He's a Jewish male, born of a Jewish mother, a virgin. And according to Luke, she understands that prophecy that he is to be the Messiah and so should be given her due as the church's first preacher. This Jesus suffered, died, and was buried. The son's death was our fault, but also for our benefit. His death seals his identity as an obedient son to the father. And he is risen. The Easter proclamation is the center of the church's proclamation from all times for the last 2,000 years. He lives with death behind him and his promise to us is eternal life. All of our history, all of history, has its end in him, as ultimately he will be the judge of the living and the dead. The third article of the Creed talks about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's work in the church. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. In what has become a very important explanation of this particular article of the creed, one that sets the boundaries for how we as Lutheran Christians understand the work of the church, Luther says this, I believe that my, by my own understanding or strength, I cannot believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But instead, the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, made me holy, and kept me true in faith, just as he calls, gathers, enlightens, and makes holy the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one communion, in the one common true faith. Daily in this Christian church, the Holy Spirit abundantly forgives all my sins, mine and, of those, and, all, and those of all believers. On the last day, the Holy Spirit will raise me and all the dead and will give to me and all believers in Christ eternal life. This is most certainly true. The Spirit is a reality in Scripture from the beginning to its end. In the book of Genesis, we hear that the earth was a formless void and darkness covered over the face of the deep. And while a wind, a ruach, a spirit of God swept over the face of the waters, it is by that same spirit that all things have life. And the prophets proclaimed, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen and whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him and he will bring forth justice to the nations and the psalmist sang songs of the spirit do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your holy spirit from me and in the new testament there is an unleashing of the spirit the spirit in and with jesus and all his followers and the Pentecost event is the sending of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples and then sending them out into the streets to declare the mighty acts of God in and through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Spirit is the very life of God and of the church, calling, gathering, enlightening you and me. And it calls the church holy and Catholic, sacred in spirit and universal in community, in the gathering of believers. Martin Luther said of the church, now the church is not wood or in stone, but the company of believing people. One must hold to them and see how they believe, live, and teach. It is a living community that has a spirit and seeks to live like Jesus the Messiah. And it is through the Spirit that your sins and my sins are forgiven. Lives are transformed and souls are set free. And so we hold on to the promise of the resurrection of the body and life, God's life, 
everlasting. Brothers and sisters, every time that you say the creed, you join the parade of saints. The great 2,000-year story of believers, of pastors, of missionaries and martyrs. And when you say, I believe in God, you become a part of something greater than yourself. The body of Christ, the fellowship of believers, God's holy church. This is most certainly true. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In 1632, in this quiet Bavarian town of Oberammergau, the plague was ravaging the local villages. And the townspeople got together and they prayed to God to save them from the deadly plague. And they promised to God that they would do a passion play, a play of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus every 10 years if God would save them from the plague. The story goes that not one more person died of the plague here in this town. And every 10 years, they gathered in prayer to offer this uh, passion play. You know, Martin Luther believed a lot in prayer. He was a monk after all. And he also wanted the people of God to understand the, the power of a prayer in their lives. And so he did an explanation of the Lord's Prayer. And it continues to be one of the best expl explanations of how we, need, how we should communicate with God. I invite you to Trinity this coming weekend to hear all about God's explanation of the Lord's Prayer. Take care. I look forward to seeing you. Auf Wiedersehen.